So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, 
and many Mayan experts work to debunk Williams' findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to Williams' methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of Williams' findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siebel, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu Underground City was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. 
There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact! Fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. 
The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces. Not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the 2nd century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heracleion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heracleion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heracleion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures in the park. 